protecting assets. We're very big into growing, growing your assets, growing your wealth, protecting it. But also, um, one of the biggest areas we see is actually succession planning, making sure that you, what you work for and strive for and what you'll achieve goes to the people that you want to go to when you're not around. So um, that's, a, that's a big area. So you'll be, watch this space, we'll be doing a lot more work in that area uh, coming up. Um, for us, it's just living into our core purpose, which is you know, creating lasting financial security with a balanced lifestyle through education. So lasting means not flash in the pan, um, not here one day, not the next sort of thing. It's, it's a lot over a period of time. Uh, balanced lifestyle, we don't want our clients to build you know, have a millstone around their neck um, by going into debt and creating this, um, uh, the lifestyle that they want or the wealth. And we do that through education. This is just uh, basically another one of our, um, our sessions. Um, this evening, about property. I hope that's what you're here for. Um, we had one, once someone turned up and said, oh, I wasn't coming to this session, I was coming to the next one. So anyway, they, they hung around. This is about property tonight, okay? Um, we're gonna go over a few things, but basically it'll be around investing in property. Um, now the current trends around Sunbury and Surrounds, how, how, the, how the price is going, what impact has the Royal Commission had? You know, the last couple of interest rate um, decreases. Uh, what impact is that going to have? You'll be hearing from our panel of experts sitting up here eagerly. Um, and where we end up tonight and, and how this how this session plays out, it's basically up to you. It is a Q&A session. It's not these guys sitting up here just building our stats and, and their opinions. It's your questions will be determined which way this session goes tonight, okay? So no such thing as a silly question, just ask away. If you don't know the answer, we'll make one up. No, we won't, we'll go. <laughs> um, so very briefly, um, our panel, Tim McCarthy, um, fellow director at Sage Business Group, Tom Best, and Maria Page from Barry Plant Real Estate in Sunbury. And we've got Gary Pretty from Smart Mind Personal Mortgages and Finance. So, can I just have 30 seconds to a minute from each one of you to, why you position yourself as the experts in, in this area? I feel like you told me to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for us, really the area we try to make sure is that property in this area is really important to us and important to our client base. It's really important from our perspective that we make sure that we're across some of those specific issues and we'll possibly touch on those later. I feel like capital gains, um, the tax planning around that, structure, superannuation, outside superannuation. So we do a lot of work in that space. Actually, over the last five years, I'd say it's pretty clear that we'd be the biggest player in superannuation and property. So if anyone wants to chat to that, I'm more than happy to help with structuring around that. Hi, I'm Simon Best. Uh, so Maria and I are uh, directors at Barry Plant and Summary. I run the sales side of the business and Maria's um, property manager. So I've got 22 years experience in, uh, in real estate. Got a business degree, a graduate diploma in uh, in property from RMIT. So I've been around a while. I've um, seen a few real estate cycles, not as many as some of my colleagues. But um, yeah, know the property market pretty well. So I'm Maria, and I'm the property manager director at Sunbury, and I've been in property management for 18 years this February. So I um, don't have any degrees like Simon, but don't have anything anyway. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> But um, I've certainly seen the, yeah, the dips and troughs and the flow of uh, property management over the years and uh, pretty well grounded in uh, what's needed to make sure that your investments are safe. So. And Gary Pretty, Smart Line Mortgage Advisor, so mortgage broker, been in banking and finance for 35 odd years, um, CBA for 30 of them and a mortgage broker for the last six years. So. Um, like the guys on the panel, said a lot of them, what's happening around the property, but sort of certainly how the lending's been impacted, particularly post rural Commission, so um, working closely with, with um, Michael and Tim and, and their client base to help grow their wealth and save some money where we can as well with some opportunities, so. Fantastic. And <coughs> Marie's right, sometimes it's not the school you go to, because the school of hard knocks, it's sometimes the best best learning school you can, you can have, so uh, um, I've been through a little bit of that myself. Okay, so look, that's enough for me. It's really, I'm going to throw it over to you. I've had some questions emailed in from people who couldn't get, but it's your night. What's a burning question from any one of these guys that you would like to know? 
Who wants to start me off with an option? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what makes Sudbury different to in any other surrounding area? It's always been, I grew up in this town, so I've been here a fair while. What makes it situated different to any sort of investment area? Uh, Here you go. Yeah. Um, I think ge geographically, Sunbury's very different. So you sort of cut off from Bully, you cut off from Clarkfields and X that way, and Gisborne, and there's a, a bit of a connect now to Diggers Rest. But I, I think that isolation, I think it, it keeps people here. I, I think um, once you're here, I think you tend to stay. The other thing, there's a lot of diversity in stock, and you can drive from, say, Gurnawara to Jackson's Hill and Find, you know, different styles, different values. So I think it caters for a lot of people. I think it allows people to, to grow within the suburb. You can start as a first home buyer and then build your forever home as well. Um, and the infrastructure, I mean, you, you've got uh, transport, two ways in, two ways out, if you go Buller Road or um, out the freeway. And, I mean, everything's here. You know, you've got you know, good shopping, um, you know, you've got a great cafe strip. I mean, in our marketing, we really talk to the lifestyle. Um, and the lifestyle here with your, your cafe strips and, and what you can do, there's you know, options for schools. So uh, a lot of these emerging suburbs, I mean, um, and we, we spoke about Tarnit before, I mean, you've got to wait for the supermarket, you've got to wait for the school, then you've got to wait for the high school, whereas here, okay. uh, everything here is it's established. Which is what we're doing in Digger's Rest at the moment as an investment. We're waiting on that suburb to, to develop some of those key commercial um, parts for it. So we're still waiting. Yeah. yeah. And somebody's going to develop further out again. So I'm just wondering where's the trend going to... Sunbury got the underlying infrastructure though. Yeah. Um, and okay. you know, whereas you're right with Diggers Rest, they're, they're the kind of suburbs you talk about. Where, okay, where you, you wait for the primary school and then as those kids go through, you, you wait for the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why established suburbs have always, I suppose, attracted a higher, you know, with relativity, a higher, a higher price because everything's there. Do you see if a, uh, a, a, a commercial precinct happening in the rest of the area? It's going to happen, yeah. Or are they going to rely on coming into to Sunbury and or going back it, to it, It's going to have to happen. Yeah. Um, whether, how it's going to happen, I mean, Woolworth, say, five or ten years ago, Woolworths had this strategy, they just put you know, Woolworths everywhere. You could drive five minutes mm -hmm. and another five minutes, there'd be a Woolworths. I don't think that, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not work for Woolworths, but I don't think that model's working. Yeah. But, um, and, and look, retail's changed as well, like, you know, click and collect and, and things like that, but there's going to have to be, even from a planning perspective, there's going to have to be some infrastructure there, and that's school, shopping, medical, all the, the basics that you need, and that's what people look for. Thank you. In terms of development, you know, you see how the development of a B 10, 20 years or something, you know, the expansion going towards diggers from Sunbury, um, and you can see expansion going out, you know, back towards the city uh, through Buller and etc. Um, where's that? You know, is it going to be? Is, is it is, is housing going to be between here and the, the diggers at some point? And is it going to go anywhere further north? Or yeah, plan to. Yeah, I mean, um, where you went? The, the, um, it's yeah. 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 So we went to um, the Sunbury Business Association dinner last year, and Villawood's presentation was fascinating mm. to see where they're going to where they're going to place properties around the area. Right back to Salesian, right back up to Melbourne Lansfield Road, and then also pushing down towards um, towards Port. Um, the interesting part for me and most was there, we're the, we're the second biggest developer here in Sunbury. So that means it's one bigger. Um, and that was really interesting where it was going. Mm. Anyone seen the PSV planes at the Marine? No. Mm. Yeah. Mm. From basically yeah. figures yeah. all the way yeah. around to the big roundabout um, houses. And then, get, and then further out, um, houses down Royal Redstone Hill, of course. On the left hand side, there'll be um, light industrial, I think, from um, on the other side of um, Redstone Hill. Um, on top of the ridge. Yeah. Uh, no, coming over onto um, the north side of uh, Sunbury Buller Road. <coughs> and then going out Melbourne Lansfield Road, the, the plan is to have another station out there, train station, mm -hmm. with a precinct similar to, I don't know, um, Nagambi's got the rowing, for example. So, but having some big, um, I suppose, uh, event management centre there. Um, that's you know, 15 years down the track or something like that. But it's interesting the comment about the PSP, which is but it's a precinct structure plan. So all these new developments, the Victorian Planning Authority, they put them into precincts called precinct structure plans, and they're designed so you don't have 
five acres developed one way, then five developed another, and then another 10 acre. It's all sort of master planned. But one of the, the challenges that the developers have got at the moment is an ICP, an infrastructure contribution plan. Now that's for the Lansfield Road precinct, for example, that's coming out, they're hoping next month. Um, but that, that's a, a contribution that could be uh, four, four or five hundred thousand dollars per hectare. The developers have got to put in, so the VPA has then got that money to put the infrastructure in. So, you know, this developer is his five acres and everything else around was in isolation, and that ICP is designed to be able to put in all the infrastructure for the whole precinct. So, that to go back to your original question, that's where you get all your traffic lights, your proper turning lanes, and your park lands, and. Um, and out on Belbeth and Drive, they're talking about a little convenience centre. So it might not be a, a full-blown shopping precinct, but might be like a little uh, quickie mart, yeah, something like that. I mean, as long as I'm having a lot of business in the Melton area, I'd hate to see somebody go down the same track as Melton, where it's so divided. But I, I think that's where we're going, just because of the geographical space that we've got. You're going to have these satellite little estates everywhere. And try to feed into the, into the town centre. Yeah, yes and no. As planning evolves, for want of a better word, yeah. I think they're trying to, to stop that. But if they go release a, a, a PSP and they sign off on it, how it gets developed is time wise is out of their hands. Like the guy in this corner could start, the guy in this corner could start, and this guy could go broke or not start at all. So they've got no control over the economics of it, just in the planning. And somebody's never followed the same trend as real estate goes. It, doesn't follow that gradual trend, it does these huge hypes. Goes yeah. from here, bang, bang. And like when I first bought my house in Dunawara, um, as, a, as a child growing up, I lost money on that because the interest rates were around 90%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 As we all probably did back, back in the day. But, you know, I, I hate to see the town fraction and not have the infrastructure to support it. Yeah, I think yeah. the fracturing, I think, is. I think that's in the hands of the developers. You'll end up like a ton, eh? Yeah, um, but the, the planning, I think, I, even in the last five or ten years, it's got a lot better. You know, even even the the, uh, the focus on parklands and recreation, and the park's just not like a quarter acre block that they chuck a couple of rocks in and someone's going to mow it. No, they're, they're fully landscaped, got uh, proper equipment. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah um, playgrounds, everything. So. Because you're talking significant population growth over that period of time yeah. as well, aren't you? Like mm, yeah. figures are thrown around with like 50,000 new residents in the summer yeah. in, in that period of time. So somebody's going to become a, you know, potentially an 80, 90,000 resident. Well, it's grown from, grown well, from so. 15,000 people or less than these lovely people that just walked in the room <laughs> to the massive amount of people yeah. and the infrastructure you want to try to support. Um, just, mm -hmm. I, I hate to see the town, I know this is not an argument, but Hate to see this town fraction into something like a tunnel, where yep. you've got not enough facility and the houses spread. And that's all we can do is keep pressure on. Yeah, which we've been doing as a business association on the council to say yeah. infrastructure's got to come before. Uh, mm -hmm. so. Sorry, yeah. there's another huge, uh, a huge attraction that is often overlooked. If you've ever worked in this city, um, there's a huge amount of population of people. Um, working in the city and who live in Sunbury yep. and um, I before I came here I lived at, um, in the boulevard at Ivanhoe um, sick of the pollution sick of the noise and you work in the city with it all as well I came out here for the peace and quiet and I was, was amazed at the time one of the biggest factors that made me stay here was the great train service mm -hmm. Um, and the small amount of time that it took to get into the city yep. from a rural area, which is quite unique. If you've ever lived in the eastern <coughs> suburbs, you'll understand what that's really all about. Definitely. Some people in the eastern suburbs take some two hours to get into the city. We're yep. so lucky here, we get an express train early morning. We can be in the city in 40 minutes, sometimes. Yes, so and that's yeah, a great factor. It's a great factor. <coughs> yep. How far down does that um, PSP go along the Melbourne Lansfield Road at the moment? It, um, so, so, right, so Bel it's the, I think the, the precinct's called Lansfield Road Precinct. Yep. The Bel there's a, a, a sub-precinct in there around Belbethan Drive. Right. Uh, I know the house in St Ronan's Court 
are in it. What's the next one? Um, was it Rays? Rays, Rays. Yeah, Rays, Rays, Rays. I think I think that PSP finishes there, but don't quite. So they've already they've opened those PSPs. No, yeah. that the PSP has been signed off. Yep. Um, but you can't get a planning permit until the ICP has been signed off. I, I used to live in Tarnik, so I'm well aware of having yeah. ten acres over there of compulsory acquisitions, a whole lot. So. Yeah. Oh, these aren't compulsory. Yeah, I don't think these are compulsory acquisitions, but yeah. um, they can't. I spoke to a developer that's got some land in that Belbeth and Drive precinct, yeah. and he said you can't even apply. They won't even look at you or apply for a, no. a permit till the ICP's out. Yeah. It was supposed to be August, supposed to be September. Yeah. Apparently, the VPA's put in the newsletter that it's now going to be released in yeah. November. So it generally gets pushed back. Waiting with bated breath. Yeah. From from an investment perspective, with all that supply, do you have the view that the established uh, houses houses in town have a better are, are a better opportunity than those out in the in the uh, the new developing estates? From experience, definitely, yeah. So as as the the town gets bigger, it can only get bigger one way, and that's further away from the established infrastructure. I know they go and put in more train stations, but you've still got some train station in the middle. They, um, the, the established medic, uh, medical facilities are still there. The established schools are still there. So we've got a, um, a property for, we just sold one in Brook Street. We've got another development site in Brook Street and it's just all around location. Mm. All the marketing's around location. Look down, you, know, you can really see the train station. You know, was alluded to before, the cafe culture. But my experience is as a town grows like that, the, the old town centre becomes more and more popular. From a tax perspective, though, yep. is there a better opportunity with the newer stock? I think we've got to be careful about putting tax perspective first or second. So can I, I, I always think that when you're buying, when you're buying stock, we want to buy, you want to buy that stock. You want to buy it as an investment, long-term investment. So let the tax play its role. And the tax is, yes, you might get some deductions for depreciation, some interest, interest on loans, all that sort of stuff. But first things first, choose the right location, the right property, make that decision. Make tax very, very much the second the second element of that discussion. Think whether you're buying a car or a property, that principle still needs to apply all the way through. The cat that's tax and also the structure you're buying in as well. Yep. 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 It's always been considered that commercial investment is better in the middle of something, okay. like as far as your returns go. But at the moment, there's a high a percentage of commercial properties unleased. What's the purpose of that? When the place is growing so quickly, do you guys have the answer for that? I don't have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, personally, I like um, commercial industrial investments. Uh, you know, your tenant pays your outgoings, pays everything. Um, you, know, you usually buy them in an entity where you, you, the, the GST is not an issue, um, but the risk and reward with that is that sometimes you can have, you know, um, longer vacancies. It's priced in summary yeah. Yeah. per square, yeah. Yeah. way, way out of market. But that, I think you know, there's a lot of places around that you know that uh, that rents are out of whack. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people trying to get, you know. 4% returns if they're selling and they're, they're not there and yeah. sometimes they'll, they'll jack the rents just to try and get a better sale price two, three years down the track. I know a lot of people that, that do that strategy. They might give, say for, on a three year commercial lease, they might give a honeymoon rate for the first year and then an agreed hike the second year, knowing they're going to sell it in year three. Yeah. So, and then, so by year three, the, the, the rate of returns there to justify a high sale price. Good point with Mo. Business Association had on, we've noticed that there, um, there are some vacancies, but when you compare them to other retail strips, they're not that bad. Um, and it goes through peaks and troughs, and what we found is a lot of the landlords in some region, commercial, especially have owned them for a long time, they get <coughs> debt, they don't care. They can sit there and wait three, four months. That's like a lot of the back end that are off the back end of the Google Road, the same thing. People, people are not needing the cash. So they're just sitting there idle, empty. Yep. But because they can afford to per square inch, it's a lot more expensive to have business here. The other renting. problem, the other problem with that is that, that in, in a, on a longer lease, so they're signing a five by five. It's harder for them to get that rent creep up to market. Yeah. So they're, they're sometimes better off having an empty six months, getting the rent they want, instead of getting a big rent hike at the end of term yep. when they do a market review. Yep. Yep. 
There's, there's also the pressure on the retail strip as well and the change in shopping habits as well. So Absolutely. So that has an impact on how we shop and how we spend our money. Click and collect online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, you don't need that footprint anymore as much as you did in the past. So. In commercial property and uh, with the business association, now I think that's probably the changing economic landscapes got more to do with that than sort of specific geographics, whether it's Sunbury or Tarnit or, or wherever it is. Is Wes Beal still in the... Oh, sorry. That's right, though. Marie's at it. Yeah, I think... <laughs> yes, uh, if you were to do uh, some crystal ball gazing um, over the next five to ten years, uh, what um, type of housing stock is somebody going to have the biggest need for? Um, we tend to read, you know, the papers that, um, you know, the empty nesters, um, a lot of single people, and people are literally living solo a lot more. Uh, do you believe that um, somebody's going to have a big need for that type of housing? Or, you know, in your field of business, uh, where do you get uh, the most inquiries for? What type of um, housing from a, stock? From a rental perspective, um, I find here that it doesn't actually matter what you've got, three bedroom, four bedroom, a townhouse, a unit, the demand's there and yeah, it just seems people just seem to fit, we find the people to fit what's, what's needed there, doesn't. I've worked in other offices where it was always, if you had a four bedroom house that was going to lease well before a unit or a three bedroom, whereas here in Sunbury, it seems that at the moment we've leased, I think we leased six two bedroom units last month. Um, and we've leased three bedroom houses, four bedroom houses, so there's a really good mix here. So yeah, just, there's, there's a good variety, so there's plenty for people to choose from. What about, Marie said, looking down the future, five to ten years, do you, do you think that will continue? Or do you well, think I think it will, <coughs> yeah, because it's, um, it, it seems that people sort of come here and they, they might start with something a little bit, maybe a two better, and then, and then it's a lot of people then keep renting and they upsize or they're happy with where they are, or, or they naturally mm -hmm. move on, or they build something. So I, I think it'll stay like that for quite some time. And that also comes into play with, um, so Gary, with the, uh, the Reserve, the, the, the Royal Banking Commissions and the Reserve Bank and things like that, you know, the availability of credit for people to, to, to build those properties. What have you seen since? Um, yeah, the so the Royal Commission's um, been interesting, has put the banks under a lot of pressure. Um, so much so that they're sort of really just sticking to policy and they're very reluctant to go outside of the square. So, um, you know, you can still get loans, um, but you have to jump through a quite a number of hoops to get there. So there is uh, quite a bit of work to be done if you're looking to borrow. Um, there's been a real focus on living expenses, so where you're spending your money before you actually apply for a loan. So the banks are now looking at your spending habits for getting a mortgage. So that's been a major change and there is a really strong focus around that. How? How the, what, they want How? your bank statements or what? Yeah, they want your bank statements. Yeah. They want, some banks especially want to see your last six months bank statements for, for your spending to see what your habits are like. Um, some banks don't quite want that much, but every bank wants... So you've got it previously, you, you estimated your living expenses and the bank just adopted either what you estimated or a minimum, what they call a household index measure. Now you've actually got to support what you're estimating with bank statements to show how you have been living. Um, and the banks are really scrutinising those living expenses very heavily. That's probably, from our point of view, the biggest change that we've seen since the Royal Commission. Whether well, they're making that investment effect. in or out of super? Super's not, inside super, they're, they're not looking at that. Um, it's really just the, the personal borrowings. Um, super sort of takes care of itself yeah. in terms of mm. it's going to get a rental return, it's going to have assets in it. So mm. um, there's not many lenders in the supermarket anymore. Mm. Supermarket, superannuation. <laughs> 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 But um, there's a couple in there, but but that's generally just a really it's an isolated standalone type of transaction. Being a longer term sort of investment. Yeah, not so much. It just yeah. it either it works or it doesn't work yeah. in terms of the rental return you're going to get on the property. So yeah. uh, and so the tax implications that these guys talk to you about as well about whether that's the right investment for you. But the market's changing. We've seen interest rates decrease. We've seen the lenders not necessarily pass on those interest rate decreases to the full extent. Um, if there's any more decreases, who knows if I'll move again, even. Um, we saw the RBA move 25 basis points just recently. Most lenders passed on maybe 13 to 15. But in interestingly, we saw the investor loans passing on the full 25 points. So interest-only investor loans were passed on those full cuts. But um, those rates are out of the market anyway. They were way too high. The bank had, 
had really cashed in mm. on charging extremely high rates on investment loans with interest only repayments question, for a long period of time. Question begs, how long is it going to be sustainable? Yeah, it's a very good question. Are we going to end up like the States, Bob? I mean, it's just an open question. Mm. I'd hate to see it. Is, 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 someone, is someone watching what happened in America? Hopefully they have. Well, it's tragic, yes. Yeah, so. we, have, we have an RBA. Yeah. That's, that, they've got a job. And yeah. their job, if you look at the chart of the RBA, is to manage inflation. That's their charter. Their charter is not to provide jobs. Mm. Their charter is not to tell us we can pay for, pay for property. Mm. That's their individual decisions. So, do you have someone looking out for us? Yes. Mm. It's a matter of interpretation as to whether, how well they're doing a job. Mm. I don't think the banks are forecasting a lot of growth in interest rates. So we've got lenders now offering three-year rates below 3%. So one came out yesterday for 2.89 mm. for three years, so that sort of indicates the rates are going to stay low for quite some time. I don't think we're going out that far. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Maybe we won't, but uh, see the situation where you're putting money in the bank and they're actually taking money off you with negative mm. interest rates. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, sorry. Just reading the paper about there's a bit of a, uh, a spike in investor loans. Yep. So is that suggesting that there's an easing from the banks and they're trying to put, you know, put more interest in, more capital into that? Does that make it easier for people in the room to then potentially go and get those loans? And if, if you're placing them at the moment, are you placing them with the majors or are you placing them with second tiers? So I've got to say, my market's changed a lot from an investor lending market to an owner-occupied market. Mm -hmm. and I think that's probably more reflective of what we've seen in this number. The investor market hasn't been quite as strong as it's been. Um, so, lending's still hard, right? It, it's, the banks are making you jump through a lot of hoops. Um, I don't think that that's going to change any time soon. They're just so uh, wound up by having got their whack from the Royal Commission that they just don't want to make any mistakes or, or do anything outside of the norm. Um, they're dropping their rates on in investment loans, which is a good thing. That may open the market up a little bit, but that market has, from my point of view, been fairly quiet for a period of time now. Are you placing them with majors, or like what you are placing on investors? I try to steer clear of the majors because they're frankly pains to deal with. Yeah. Um, so I try and deal with the second tiers when I can. Um, second tiers, whilst they're owned by CBA, the likes of Bank West, yeah. um, ING, um, those sort of second tiers, so well known brands. But um, yeah, the majors are, are hard work sometimes. So. What you've got to remember is there was a big sell-off of investment properties too. Mm. So two or three years ago when the market was absolutely flying, um, a lot of investors got out. But we sold, um, one of our businesses, we sold one seventh of the rent roll in the space of 12 months because, well, if you can get that, well, I'll sell. And you got it and more. Mm -hmm. So they were selling out, they were taking their profits and going there, whether they were waiting for the, the, the bubble to burst and they're reinvesting now. But if you put it into perspective, the amount of investment properties there were three years ago, a lot of them went out of the market and they went to owner occupiers. Hardly ever went back to investors, no, did that? No, oh, no, I, no, 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 no. I, I, I'd hazard a guess that less than 10% of that investment stock that was sold went back onto the investment market. Mm. It was all, you know, first home buyers, because that's, you know, first home buyers and investors always compete for stock, apparently. Um, but when the investors sold out, a lot of it was back to first home buyers. So it, it's, some of it might be just a correction in the market, bringing that investment stock back on. Can come get down the back. <coughs> Does Hume Council or Shire help us in any way? They seem to develop more over their side and left Sunbury just sitting here. Yeah. Oh, I think. They're starting to, with the PSP plans and that are, that are coming up, I think um, they have to recognise us now. Uh, because there's a lot of, um, of, of things happening here. And we really are putting constant pressure on council about infrastructure first. Um, the PSP plan and meetings that I went to, um, we did say, it's <laughs> always a way of it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel for you, that's what happens. <laughs> um, so yeah, we are putting a bit of pressure on the council. Um, I think I, I think there'll be um, a lot more infrastructure put in first um, than has happened in the past. Is what I'm just saying. No. I think they've learned from no. uh, from past experiences. Yeah, no, 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 That's yeah, what I'm, sorry. No. I'm yeah. hoping. 
I think the road from Sunbury to the airport is appalling. And when yep. they spent all those months building that last bit, there been two lanes up to the airport. What a waste of time. You want to try going down there? Yeah, you won't get any um, arguments out of me from that. Yeah. And that, especially when the developers such as Bill Wood are building Redstone Hill, for example, for the commuters, because they're building it out there so you to jump on the road, boom, boom, boom. So there has to be something done about that. Um, and all we can do is keep putting pressure on council. There'll be statistics that change, is it? Yep. Fortunately. Yeah, the, the numbers will drive them. Council, all levels of government work with numbers, data. Yep. Well, again, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. As I said, it happens quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Tim, I've had a couple of questions. You've got off a bit lightly lately um, so far. Uh, <laughs> uh, can come in about um, property investing, the different structures. How easy, hard, what do I have to do if I want to invest in a super fund? Yeah. So we touched on Gary for sort of the financial the super fund before. The biggest question I think with the super fund is whether or not you're going to do this with a lending arrangement or without a lending arrangement. But even before that, the question becomes: Should I actually use my super as a as a vehicle to purchase property um, for as a combination for a period? Absolutely. For a period of time, also you have liquidity. I think liquidity is one of the important issues with super as you get closer to retirement. But if you try and grow the super and use property in there. Be aware of, I guess, what the purpose of the fund is. Your purpose of your super fund is to provide for your, for your benefit of your retirement. Nothing else. A, we can use it for all sorts of fancy things, but if that's a perspective, so if I'm 37, I'm making a very, very different decision if I'm 57. That's just the, that's just the reality of, of life and the way we are. So I think that's probably one of the first things is to actually understand completely with my super, why am I doing this? What's the purpose behind it? Then structurally, it's really getting your head around the fact that the investment is not yours. It's yours, but not yet. So in terms of superannuation, <coughs> it's a separate investment to everything else. It's treated differently. It's very, very clinical, I suppose is probably a word I'd use around it. So if you're going to play with property and super, get yourself really clear around what am I going to have to do as the trustee of the fund? You'll have to have a self-managed fund because other than obviously Pablo's at the back there and he does a bit of investing for us in terms of um, going to larger scale property developments through super, you don't have to, so you have to have a self-managed fund for that. But if you wanted to direct, direct property, say it's property in summary, you need a self-managed fund. Understanding the rules around that is really, really important at the start, I'd say. Yeah, a lot of rules and regulations, very clinical. And I agree with you, you can take the emotion out of it. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a decision, a business decision. Mm. Um, your own super, your own affairs, those little mini businesses, you should treat your own uh, wealth creation strategies as a, as a business. Um, while we're on that, there's, there's, a, there's a myth here, we've got, I get, this is dear to my heart, I get this quite a bit. Um, Tim, I've, I've lived on the place of you know, 13 acres, say, Gisborne South, or, or out towards Riddle, 13 acres, it's always been my principal place of residence, so I don't have any capital gains tax, do I? You I wish. <laughs> uh, it is a complete myth. If you live in Gisborne South, if you live in Kyneton, Clarkfield, Romsey Lansfield, Figures Rest, the reality is that the only the way capital like gains and slash is written is everything is included but for exclusions and not the other way around. So therefore, one of the, the critical exclusions is your home, which is it's the home. But the when you look at the break it down, it's your house in Kirtledge being two hectares or five acres that are same produced and when you're born, that's what you call that. So it's the house and the five acres. The other eight acres for a bike in Gisborne South. Gisborne South, you're going to play capital gains tax on that. Now it can be managed, absolutely, but awareness around that's really, really important. It's, it's frightening how often people come in that have had nine acres and sold it at a nice little block and sold, sold, sold it, we'll always live there, that's no dramas. Just coming on, just give me a group certificate. Oh dear, we've got a problem. So be aware, think around that. There's the house and five acres. Spread the word, please. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's the one thing you do. Hashtags and all that sort of stuff. If you have to. The land's worth nothing unless you can develop it. 
not according to the tax office. Mm. So, um, so I agree with you, yeah. but you've got to re have a reasonable arguable, arguable Especially position. Especially in the area you just spoke about. Yep. So look, so the reality is there is capital gains tax on those on those actions, and yet there are ways to manage it, and valuers can help you through that and all like. But you just be aware. Just on that, most things that we own are subject to capital gains tax. Absolutely. It's just that they tend to like cars and stuff go down in value whereas property goes up. So, as Tim said, it's an all-inclusive tax, except for some exclusions. Um, okay. Uh, just, I'd like to go back to the, um, uh, about the interest rates, I suppose, and also, and Maru's question about, you know, what sort of homes, that, you know, looking five to 10 years, or homes or investments, um, the impact it has on, it's demand and supply, basically rules everything, doesn't it? So, and planning. And planning, okay. That's the third. Okay. Yep. So, um, you know, I'm sort of sitting here thinking about getting into the property market or I'm, I'm already in it. Um, yeah, you, have, you don't have a crystal ball, but what are the type of properties, you know, the, the density, the um, number of bedrooms, you know, the um, features that I would be looking for if I wanted to have it in a property that in 10 years' time I could make some money on, in your opinion? All those that are all those that are unnecessary. All those that are unnecessessary. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the ones to avoid. Oh, the reason I mentioned I threw the planning in there is that the so blocks are getting smaller and smaller. So um, Highlands in Craigieburn, for example, were selling 189 square metre blocks. I don't know how big they were, so 189 grand you're paying thousand bucks a square metre. So 189 square metre block. Now you can't go and build. A substantial family home on 189 square metres. So um, it's interesting, you know, even I'm not that old, I don't think I am anyway, but um, you know, it was all those, the, the quarter acre block, quarter acre block is no longer. If you've got a quarter acre block, they're putting 10 units on it. So uh, a big block now was 450, 500. It used to be 800, then it went to 700. Now a big block, I've got a big block, 500 square metres. Um, you know, if you look back into the inner suburbs, somewhere like well, somewhere close by, like Essendon, for example, well, one of those blocks are 500 square metres, um, and they were considered small back then, but now that's your average size. But as blocks get smaller, the housing stock has got to be built to adapt to that, so we're going to see more and more two-storey, obviously, because 189 square metres with your private up, private up space, you're going to have to go up. So the planning and how the blocks are cut up are going to dictate the type of stock, now, does that mean that in 10 years' time, those townhouses with the European laundry and all these funky designs are, are going to be popular? Or are people going to think, well, there's actually value in a quarter acre block in the middle of town? And to go back to the, the question earlier about the centre of town, those new estates have got all these covenants where you, that they, they're very strict what you can do. It's got to be this facade, got to be this size, these building materials. Generally speaking, the older parts of town, they don't have those covenants. They don't have single dwelling covenants, so you can knock the house down and build units. So, you know, even over time, that's what happens in the in the core of the town. Everything gets knocked over, and those bigger blocks get converted to to unit sites anyway. So, I think in ten years' time, you're going to find that we're all living smaller. From a rental perspective, do people pay for the fourth bedroom in the rumpus room, or so, some people will? If that's it depends what they need. Or what, it's, it all depends on what's needed. If they've got a large family, or they might have a home-based business, or it, it just depends. People are happy to pay. Do you yeah. price them differently for three and four bedrooms? Yeah, and it usually, depending on what other inclusions are in them, it can be a difference of about sometimes thirty dollars a week. We've been having a discussion for fifteen years, probably, yeah. <laughs> and that, that if a builder ever came to us and says, "I've got this great idea to build one-bedroom apartments," what we'd say to him, or because, I mean, I think that'd be a great idea, but do I think they're that great an idea that I'd tell someone to go and sink all their money into an investment to do it? That's, well, I couldn't do that. But I, I'd really love to see someone go and do, you know, little smart, you know, one bedrooms, European laundry, you know, the, the en suites, the, the guests, you know, if the guests come, they use the en suite to go to the toilet and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, smart like parking. Studio yeah, like studios. Yeah, studios. Um, it, 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 I, that's the thing. You yeah. know, I, I, I think there'd we be a demand. We think there'd be a demand for it, especially, <laughs> especially as rental stock. I don't think you're going to get yeah. owner occupiers getting them. Yeah. But you think about you know, young couples. They don't need a second bedroom. They, they live in the same bedroom. Yeah. 
You know, singles, no matter what, what age they are, they, they live in one bedroom. Um, a lot of people now, they entertain not at home, they'll go and meet someone for coffee. So that, that need for entertaining is not there. I don't think there'd be a big owner-occupier take-up, but I think as an investment, I, I think they, they'd, be, they'd be pretty good. You've got that huge development that's just happened on the side of Jackson Silk. I'm not sure what size uh, yeah, they're, they're well they're, as they are. But they're twos, I think. And, and who's got structure of what's going in there? Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. Yeah. yeah. But, they, but they've, got a, they've got a shopping centre on the supermarket. Oh, yeah. 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 oh, look yeah. up there. It's great. So, yeah. but, but that brings yeah. all the convenience. Yeah. My, my cousin's, like, he's a hipster, but he's got, like, a, a master's in environmental engineering, and he was involved in that building in Moreland, which was the first building in Moreland Council that got through without parking. And they gave all the residents my kit cards, and there was bike parking. So they tried to have this green building where... They'd all park their bikes and then walk up to the tram with their mic head. And he, he said, oh, it was that well received. And he was, he was involved in the engineering and, and planning of that. And I thought, it staggered me that you're in Brunswick and, or Coburg North or somewhere like that it was. No, Coburg, sorry. And no parking whatsoever. You're relying on people with my keys and... Not so much. Which is a different concept out here because... Yeah, you're yeah. on the fringe there. Yeah. yeah. I think a challenge that also comes in trying to finance a purchase of them yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, banks are scared of anything that's sort of sub 50, 40 square metre living space. So um, you're pretty much talking about investors or purchasers who are pretty cashed up to buy those things because the banks are going to cut down. Um, just tying that in too, buy. Gary, just um, with conversations being going around. You're saying there that you know, those one bedders would be great cash flow and it'd be good for renters. Because um, in, in my opinion, in my experience with the property, it's um, what drives the market is this, you know, investors, then it's owner occupiers, investors, owner occupiers. And if you've only got something that appeals to an investor, maybe, and this is just my opinion, you might not get that same push as you do on something that is appealing to both. I don't know. Yeah, good point. I mean, I, and it goes back to your investment philosophy, you know, yeah. like, um, you know, it's. You have the it's, cash flow, you have yeah. the growth. Uh, you, yeah. know, it's, you ask the old bloke, you know, what's it worth? Am I buying or am I selling? Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's a lot of people, I mean, and the old mentality used to be you buy for long term. Yep. And I think it's only been the last 10 or 15 years where people have got this idea of flipping. And that flipping doesn't work in Australia because it costs you to get in with stamp duty, it costs you to get out with commissions and taxes. And you know, um, someone was saying today there's a model in the US where the agency goes and buys the property at an agreed price, they do it up and then give you. 25% of the uplift, but it works because there's no stamp duty and there's no tax and... You know. so take, take for instance, Jackson Hill, many years ago, you could buy a block of land up there for about 120 grand. Yep. Put a house on it for about 200, and houses up there are getting around eight to a million dollars now, depending on the size of the block. Yeah, it wouldn't what's, get much less than six, 650 in there. What's driven that? Just underlying demand. Yeah, the, we, we've had a bit of a perfect storm for real estate. We've had um, you know, fairly stable interest rates, fairly good unemployment rates, and we've had a massive influx of immigration. And hence, back to what I said at the start, was that somebody's never really, and correct me if I'm wrong, has never really followed that trend. It's always had these huge pipes and, and jumped. You know, 12 years ago, I did exactly that. Yep. Porches land in Jackson Hill, put a house on it, and now it's worth 500 grand. Yeah, look, every, every, there's different pockets that go up and down. I mean, you know, you see suburbs that buck the trend and the Herald Sun's all over those. And the REA, or realestate.com.au, that, that's one of the things they do. They map the, the hot suburbs because they've got very good eyeballs on, on buyer activity and what sells and things like that. But, I mean, over time, if you look at the, the, the Melbourne graph is, you know, not steady, but it, 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 it climbs, it dips, and you know, some might buck the trend, some might not. But... Mm. You look at, you go to some places like Craigieburn's Classic, um, Tarnit's another one. They just, you, you can tell that's where the, the, the immigration's going. Yeah, they had that suburbs, they? they had crazy. Well, it depends. Not, not people, yeah. but the size, the, yeah. the size and the growth that's happened there so, so quickly. Yeah. You know, it's just... It's, you get it early. Like I said before, is this sustainable? Yeah. Are we going to sustain all this influx in? Are we going to be able to support it? What happens to us in 15, 20 years' time? I think we can. I, I personally think we can support Crystal the board. population. Yeah. I just wonder whether there's going to be jobs for everyone. Well, that's not. not like my oldest is 11 years old. They're telling me the job you'll have at 18 is not even around at the moment. My kids want to play yeah. basketball, but yeah. that's that's not a reality. One up to one up. Yes, that. <laughs> but I think that 
the shift in economics is going to be bigger than any other traditional factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, offshoring jobs, automation, you know, AI, um, you know, a, a labour force that has got to be, you know, more skilled. I mean, you know, <laughs> bookkeepers, for example. I mean, you can get an offshore bookkeeper for about a third of the, the, the yeah. cost. If they're not client facing, but what are, we, what are we doing as a country? I work in the aircraft industry, and amongst that's many that's other things, it's, it's just not there anymore. So, so it's more interesting. You look at these rows of the big pictures up here, some of property here at the home, mm -hmm. back on that. But the reality is that a few weeks ago, they made a big announcement around investment into trades through uh, Morris to make some announcement that. In 2007, we're talking about being an educated nation. We have to allow the world to evolve itself. Some will evolve in the same way as jobs will evolve. There'll be jobs that, well, as you said, the jobs that don't exist at the moment, the kids will be doing in seven or eight years' time. The jobs that we're doing now that didn't exist 30 years ago. So I think a lot of that looks after itself. The, the natural, the law of the jungle actually works a lot of that out. I think the word there is awareness. As long as you're aware that that's going to happen, it doesn't matter if it's in property, in business, anything, you've just got to be aware of what what is influencing your decisions. Um, and, you know, you're not going to be on top of all of them, but just be aware of them. Um, what, I know you're very clear, you put out um, like a, a newsletter, things about what's been selling and, and things like that. What's, what's, what's been moving in what's a hot property in, in some at the moment? Uh, How are you seeing the market? Yeah, well, the market's red hot. I mean, um, if we've got something, and look, in any market, it's price right, it's going to sell, but we had, uh, we had one in Keith Avenue, what was it, three weeks ago? Yeah. 23 people to an open for inspection on, on a Saturday, and you get four offers out of it. Um, we had one in, uh, no, that one was 21, the one in Macau, um, 23 people. You know? um, so we, we took over the, the Wallow brand in July, in July um, and that was one of the, the crossover properties that had been on the market for maybe six weeks, we did our first open and did nothing different. Same photos, same write-ups, same websites. Um, and you look at the reports, no one through, no one through, and bang, we had 23 people through the first open. Now that was, it's easy to say that's our brand and that's what we did, but, but there's nothing different. It was literally the same photos, same write-up, just reloaded a bit higher on the internet, um, on realestate.com.au, and you get four offers and, and you're off. But Outside investors of Sunbury? You know what? Most of the people that buy in Sunbury are from Sunbury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And same with Diggers. Diggers Rest, uh, they the people in Diggers Rest, because of the style of stock, a lot of people uh, are moving out of a rental into owner occupier. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, one in um, in Rockfern, one in Rockfern, and one in Rest Haven, and both of those were um, actually. Uh, Rockfern was, Rock was, was a rental, yeah. um, and the guy moved into it as a first home buyer. And um, the first home buyers sold out of uh, Rest Haven, and first home buyers bought it, but they've been renting in the area. And the cycle continues. Yeah, and I think for first home buyers, loan affordability is better than what it's ever been before as well. Um, banks changed assessment rates, so previously they used to show affordability at a rate of 7.4 to 7.5, now they're showing affordability at 5.5, 5.75. So loan affordability, particularly for first home buyers, is probably better than it's ever been before from a, from a lending point of view. I did some numbers the other day for a client who I saw six months ago, couldn't afford a loan to buy the property he wanted, come back and saw me under the new guys. Um, he could afford $100,000 more on his loan than what he had previously when he bought his first home. Yeah, so, so that's really, I think, helping home buyers get in the market as well. So keep doing your research, keep doing your homework mm. as your message there. Mm. Because things can change. Yep. yep. Um, do you see, uh, are there tiers, like, you know, a 600, is that a... Is that a pricing point and then is it up to me? Oh yeah, any market's got that. Yeah. So, I mean, your, your cheaper properties, it's like a pyramid, your cheaper property. So if I said I've got a property uh, for sale for 200000 who could afford it? Everyone's hand would go up. I've got 300, most hands, 400, most, I'll get to a million, you might only have one hand up. Yeah. So that's why, the, the, and I said it before, the investors and first home buyers, they, they scramble for the cheaper stock. Yeah. Um, but you know, as you go up, the owner occupiers are a bit more discerning. First home, second um, home, third. Yeah. Third, yeah. But the, I think we, we've got a, a program that gives us price segmentation. So between five and seven is where the bulk of the, the summary stock sells. Mm. Okay. What was that for five years ago? Uh, we probably had. Um, uh, what would be the growth to be? 2017 was probably about 10% growth. So 
Oh, I reckon even with the downturn, it's probably about a 20% lift. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Um, and that's probably come down off at its peak on four years, maybe 30. That's come back a bit, but yeah. Um, even that downturn stabilised now, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Yeah, but I mean, the downturn, the downturn, or the downturn was a bit funny actually because um, there wasn't. It was a bit of a. It was a bit of a, a bit false because if you didn't need to sell, you didn't. You heard on the radio and in the newspaper, oh, markets down, don't sell, don't sell. So if you didn't need to sell, you didn't sell. You said, let's just wait 12 months. We can hold on for another 12 months. Unless you had a family bursting at the seams, or you were moving for work, or you know, the old bust up, um, you, you didn't sell. So there was, wasn't as much stock on the market either. Um, and then the stock came, the stock starts to come back on the market, and you know, the buyers come back too because it's a good time to sell because it's a good time to buy. I think you said before a lot of people cashed in on those great prices as oh, well, yeah. didn't they? So, yeah. 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 I live out near Riddle and I commute to work there and come to somewhere a lot. But uh, mm. I watch the news and I see the you know, the police getting shot at it, they're driving around. Uh, uh, and I don't know, read the papers about crime and stuff. Are there any particular, or what is the particular risk profile around investing in a rental property? Is there a risk profile? There's a so, risk in anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I know there's a risk in anything, but what is it? What, what, well, you know, is it, I don't know, in comparatively speaking, you've been in the business for a long time, you know? Obviously, yeah. someone looking to invest in Sunbury, do they need to consider those risks uh, more than, I don't know, I can maybe talk somewhere. into that and that there's another hat I've got on is I'm part of the steering committee that looks at the C has a CCTV in the area, so I'm always talking to the police. And they, they say Sunbury, compared to a lot of other places, it's pretty good. We, we, we do here, um, we have our fair share, but compared to the other police that sort of um, come in, they said, that might be for the police, but the police might not get involved in the rental market. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not sure interested in hearing from you about, uh, you, know, the, you know, the rental market and the risks associated with that. I'll, I'll preface it. That I, I would say to someone, right, you've got to have an investor mindset because then if I, sell, if I sell someone a home and they think it's a good idea to have a rental property because their mate or their brother's got one, and they handball them off to the, the, the rental department, then... That's when you get the, oh, yeah. I didn't know this and I didn't yeah. know that. And, and so, and, and there's a risk, and like Simon said before, there's a risk in everything. But I suppose if you try to minimise that risk and you give it to an agency or a property manager that's got experience, that knows what to look for. Now, I'm not saying that I'm the best one and I'll get you the best tenant because I don't know people personally. But from from what I do at my office is that I make sure that, that we can check their references, we can make sure that they've got jobs and check their finances and, and you can ask a lot more questions. Now people that really want something are quite happy to give you that information if they've got nothing to share, if nothing to hide. Um, but the most important part with anything with risk is that you need to have the right insurance. So th th like there's a risk in everything, but it's a risk you take. It be <laughs> nipping it in the bud by your regular inspection That's right. as well yeah. Um, yeah. and actually going into the house. Yeah. Not just yeah, not just driving past or, mm. you know, yeah, hiding yeah. the grass a bit long or giving yeah. you a hit but, but it, it does come back to management. How many times have we, you have a landlord, oh, I'm with this agent, the tenant's terrible and I'm sick of them, they're not doing anything, can you take it over? We take it over and the tenant in there is someone we've kicked out and they never rang us for a reference check. Mm. Now, we'd have rang for a reference check. Yeah, we took the bond off. We, don't, we can only state the facts. We took the full bond. Um, there was damages to the property and they left owing rent. Right? Now, that agent has put this tenant in a property without ringing the previous agent. Now, if they say, oh, where have you been the last six months? Oh, yeah, overseas and that, you know, just sort of did a bit of a trip around Europe. And you can, you can tell that there's, there's, gap, holes in that there's gaps in where they're, where they've been living. Like, they haven't been living anywhere for nine months. Oh, yeah, he's been living with my brother in his garage and that. I mean, well, you don't want those kind of people usually anyway. They've been stereotypical. But, I mean, you can pick gaps in, in their story. And social media is a good one now that you can mm. actually check people. Mm. Right, so the risks are manageable. Yeah, they're, they're manageable. Yeah. yeah. Probably also manageable what you buy too. Yeah. And if you buy rubbish, you'll get rubbish. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So, on, you had a question. Um, if, if you're um, an investor and you're in, investing in one property opposed to... Yeah, I've got to know that in four or five properties, is there a different way you structure that would you run a trust or is there 
better ways if, you, if you're thinking long term? Yeah, it, there are there are options around trust companies, superannuation, and investing in your own name. Even choosing whether you invest together jointly or whether you invest um, separately, as in husband or wife or spouse, I should say, um, spouse, either way. It, whether you choose to invest as joint tenants or tenants in common, there's all these aspects there. The, so the answer, the answer is yes, there might be some options around trust. What you need to be aware of around trust is that if you're investing something for a negative gear, gear, gearing option, you may well want that and look at the tax benefit, you won't want that in the trust necessarily because the trust captures the losses that can't be offset against your other income from work. If you're looking at something for a positive gear, absolutely your trust might be there. Also, they're going to weigh out the land tax issues too. So trust pay a slightly higher rate of land tax, um, generally speaking. But then the long-term benefit can be for the trust. Well, actually, now the, the children at the moment are 13, 12, and 11. We're going to hold this property for 23 years, or 20 years, or 15 years, whatever the aim is. Therefore, they'll all be adults by the time we sell it. Oh, geez, there's flexibility around how we might own it. We've got one client um, in particular who he likes the idea of buying. He's got four children, and he's what he actually wants to buy a house for each child, and that's his sort of you name. Know, he's using the trust very, very carefully as a way of estate planning. So he set up the trust specifically. So trust A, should anything happen, the control of that trust goes to daughter, daughter one, and so on and so forth. So absolutely, if you're planning a portfolio, think through what you're doing. On the same token, I'm gonna to say this, there are some books out there that tell you that you should buy every house for a trust. That's just someone flogging a dead horse. That is, the bad of people who are, who are promoting their own brand, don't, do, don't fall for that trick, please. Everyone's situation is different. Absolutely. Don't read a book and say, I need to buy everything in a trust. That's just, just wrong. Simple as that. Let's say you're kicking off a trust and then you bought your first asset and it doesn't have a, a, a history of bank records and all that sort of rubbish. What about financing? Yep. Yeah, it doesn't have to have a history of being a rental property or anything like that. Most of the banks will, will happily take uh, real estate agent appraisals to, for, for servicing. No, but I mean, if you're buying if you're buying an asset in a trust or, yep. or whatever the structure may well be, and it's yep. just been set up for that purpose, yep. and then you're going to a major or whoever a broker to yep. to set up a finance facility for that, yep. I'm, I'm assuming that that's reasonably difficult if it's hard just for someone to buy the first time. No, not at all. No, okay, not so it's straightforward. It's, it's no different to someone buying in, in your individual name. You just um, so how do you get around there's the some, There's some lenders that won't take, um, well you're relying on the director's income generally. So right. the trust hasn't made any income mm -hmm. before, it's a brand new one. Um, obviously there's rental income on the property they're buying, but then you're, you're falling back to the director's income for yep. servicing from that point of view. I think in terms of the investing, it's also important to understand who you're going to invest with. Um, I've had a couple of clients recently who have bought investment properties jointly with family members, and then they've peeled off and wanted to buy their own home. Yes. And the way the bank assesses that is they hold that person jointly and severally liable for the full investment debt. Um, so that can have repercussions on the, on the people wanting to borrow outside of that, that arrangement as well. So buying investment properties with family members does come with some risk um, mm -hmm. in terms of future borrowing potential as well. Just conscious of the time, we said, I think it was about an hour, was it, Linda? I think so, depending on okay. questions. But um, <laughs> uh, we're happy to, to hang around, but anyone who has to leave, um, but, but is there something that we didn't get to talk about that you'd really like to impart some knowledge to, to our, our guests this evening? What have we covered? Mm -hmm. I, think that's I think from my point of view and, and what we've done working really well with is if you do have home loans and you don't know what the interest rate is or haven't reviewed them for a while, it's a great time to review now. There's some absolutely outstanding deals in the market. And Won't the banks do that for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, banks, banks are fantastic at attracting new clients, but rewarding their existing mm -hmm. clients is just no chance whatsoever. Um, and without naming names, we just refinanced one of our mutual clients um, from one lender to another, and we've saved them 6,000 a year in interest just because they haven't looked at their arrangements for the last well, couple of years or so. In context, that's not a half million dollar loan. That's not yeah. a five million dollar loan, that's half a million dollars. Yeah. The only one thing actually I've would say, is that over the years I've had a lot of people that they've um, so they, they've got the house say, in Gurdwara, and that's their first home, they've been there 10 years and they've saved up and they've got equity and they go up to Jackson's Hill and they say, now I want to, I want to rent this out. Mm -hmm. I always say to them, don't rent out a house you've ever lived in. It's just the emotional, you want an investment property, sell that one, go buy another one. Something that you can, 
you want to be able to just drive past and forget you even own it because once you've lived in it, oh, but no. When I was there, when I was there, the gardens were always. Oh, and, oh, and my kids, my kids, my kids, they they planted that. Look at that down to the tree. It's just this emotional attachment, um, and it just it really works, doesn't it? It doesn't ever work. Oh, okay. oh, I, had, <laughs> I had one not long ago, and she went off. Oh, Marie, my house was brand new thirty years ago. Yeah, thirty years ago. It's not that old. And a lot of people have lived in it in that thirty years. <laughs> Yes. You can add to that, I'd imagine, from a tax perspective, that sometimes it's just not the best option. And you've probably paid your home down. And then there's a misnomer that you can go, oh, I'll just borrow up on this new place. Yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. So that's what I would say about the year in the life is, uh, tax office could not care less about what your security is on your lending. They care about what was the purpose of the loan. So you, if you do that, if you do that scenario there, and you borrow the new house, that's all right, I'll jack up the loan on the old place and then I'll, I'll use it on the new place. Not gonna work. So before you buy a property, strategically think through what you're doing and I'll get a test for best you there because I did it. And it was the greatest house of all time in Romsey that I lived in. And you know, the re, when I look back now, the reality was the tenants treated it no worse than I treated it. It just was them treating it, not me. <laughs> And sometimes it's easier, isn't it? Just to go, you know what, I'll make that investment property rather than go through the process yeah. of starting mm -hmm. and well, really just see what we get rid of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yep. If you're an investor that wanted to buy so many properties now because of this huge growth spurt somebody's got and you had the idea in the future, that's where you were going to make your money because you're a long term investor, you never sold. Would you? Would you look at the centre of Sunbury to buy, or would you be looking at the perimeter towns to buy them because they were cheaper? I'd always buy the best That's you can afford. And Sunbury was it was yeah. too expensive. Buy the best you can afford. I think you make your money when you buy, not when you sell. Yeah. yeah. So you'd be buying in the centre of Sunbury, or if, oh, if, areas if, of if Sunbury. I could, if, if there was something worth five hundred in the centre of Sunbury. And I, I had to buy, pay 500 I for it. Is there anything left in Sunbury? For oh, no, by, by, by way of example, <laughs> so if there was something for if there was something for in the centre of town worth 500, and I bought it for 500, as opposed to something a little bit further out that was worth 400, and I paid 300, I'd be going for the one that was the hundred thousand dollar discount. Yeah. Did you buy a number? I mean, my my mum's next door neighbour. She I think she was 101 when she died, and uh, her brother. Um, he was a bit older or something, but he had a house in Essendon and it was in the papers. When he died, they sold it and it was in the papers because it, they couldn't find someone that had lived in the one house since he was like 20 or something. He'd been there for like 85 years or something like that. And they, they were saying, does anyone know anyone that's lived in a house for longer than this? But it, it, and it sold for like 1.1 1 .1 and mm -hmm. he paid three shillings for it or something, but he might have paid overs at three shillings. It might have only been worth two. <laughs> but you know, after 80 years, everything's worth a lot more than what you paid for it. Yeah. The interest of wrapping up on time, because um, it's your evening into your evening. Um, please work, feel free to hang around. Um, but please just get your, give your hands, put your hands together for the four.